Do you want to take on boss-level monsters to clear out a place called Dreadmire Swamp? Do you want to enter the world of Hellboy for 5th edition and create your own case files? Do you want to capture the souls of monsters and craft them into magic items? Books that offer answers to all of these questions await you in the latest episode of D&D New Releases, so let's get started. Hi, it's Splinterverse. Welcome to another episode of D&D New Releases, where we offer first impressions of new third-party products for Dungeons & Dragons. We cover a selection of titles from Dungeon Masters Guild and Drive Through RPG each week. The titles are presented in alphabetical order, and all of them are linked in the video description. Purchasing the books using those links helps the channel, but you can also support us by purchasing one of our best-selling books. Our newest release, Dragonlance Companion, offers 180 pages for players and DMs to bring the magical world of Kryn to life. And like many of our books, it's available in hardcover and digital format. Our Swarms of the Multiverse offers over 70 brand new creatures, including their associated swarms, instructions on how to make your own balanced swarms, and lots of bonus materials such as four new demiplanes. Our Feywild Companion offers 150 pages of Feywild fun for players and DMs alike. Also, our book, Fizzband's Vault of Draconic Secrets, contains over 50 pages of dragon-themed player options, including a subclass for each class and much more. We've got lineages suitable for any setting, as well as optional lineage rules in our Van Richten's Librem of Lineages. With our Potions Unlocked book, we have over 100 pages of material to take potions to the next level in your game. Please support the channel by purchasing our books using the links in the video description. First we have Arcane Tools, Treasures, and Trinkets, 100 Unusual Magic Items for Old School Fantasy Role Playing by Timothy Dunham and Mothic Knight. Uh, and I've looked a through this and I think there's quite a few that can be used for 5th edition as well. But it's really cool and it's a suggested price of $2 on Pay What You Want. I'm not sure how many pages, but you can see there is really cool artwork also done by the author throughout. So all of these sort of antiquated items are illustrated in a really cool fashion that's consistent. And uh, it says, this book contains these 100 items for use in your games to make them more interesting than the usual plus one sword. It says it's an adventuring helpline. Uh, or, or sorry, that's one of the items. There's an adventuring helpline, a curse-eating bug, a haunted sledgehammer, armor that fights on after you die, and more. I mean, they sound so creative, and you'll see some of the the really uh, fun ones that I've that I've already seen as we go through it. But you can see it starts off with a list of all the items, you, so you can roll a d100 and determine what is found if you want. But this also serves as a table of contents, so that's a really creative way of, of doing the table of contents. It starts with Adamantine Maddock, and it goes all the way down to the Worm Ring. So, and it looks like it's around 59 pages. Um, but you can see as I'm scrolling through, really cool stuff. So here's that Adventurer's Guild Advice service. It says, this device allows the user to contact an Adventurer's Guild advisor who can give advice and information on a range of adventuring topics. So it's kind of like phone a friend on on uh, who wants to be a millionaire or something. Uh, it says queuing when the device is activated, the user is placed in uh, 2D 100th in a queue. Every 10 minutes, the user will advance 1D 20 places in the queue. While in the queue, the device will play poor quality loot music and periodically state how much the guild values your call. Um, and then there's a priority queue. It says advice when the user reaches the front of the queue, roll a 1d6 and consult the table below to determine the quality of advice they receive in response to their question. <laughs> um, so that can be anything from unhelpful advice to expert advice. So as the as the DM, you'll have to, you know, basically provide the answer, you know, role playing and improvising as this this helpline uh, adventurers guild advisor. But, you know, maybe if they're asking, can I, you know, can I jump over this and, and and what do you what do you think my chances are? You know, if it's unhelpful advice, you could just say something completely unrelated and hang up, right? 
Um, if it if it's expert advice, you can say, well, you know, maybe you should do a running start and you should do this and that to get across this chasm successfully with a jump or whatever whatever you're asking about, right? So it's kind of cool, and I love I love the picture. It looks like an old time radio with a little. Um, a uh, funnel, uh, whatever you call that, that you would listen to or or speak in back in the day for for phones. That probably is an old phone. I just haven't looked at one of the original phones. Um, but you've got this apparatus of the spider. There's even this ancient soup, which has different effects based on uh, what you roll. So it could be a poisonous soup all the way up to gelatinous soup. Creature gains the ability to transform into a gelatinous cube once per day, as if using the su- spell polymer self. So. Again, this is for OSR, but you could just use Polymorph for 5th edition, right? And and turn it into a gelatinous cube. But again, that, that could be too powerful depending on the group. So as with all magic items, the DM needs to look at the item and think about the level. But some of them are even kind of simple, like this one. It says, archaeologist archaeologist's dial. When placed on an object, the dial turns to indicate how old that object is. It's accurate accurate in increments of 100 years so you could get within 100 years of the age of something but they're just all so lovingly illustrated here's a book wheel it says this large floating rotating platform holds multiple open books to aid in studying Uh, the book wheel can be commanded to magically turn to specific pages search the books read passages aloud and other usual functions uh, and then it also has accelerated study. This allows the user to complete spell memorization, magical research, or other book-based research and investigation in a quarter of the user, usual time. So easy to convert many of these to 5th edition or use them in your OSR. Um, but I just love how illustrated they are. I love the price. I love the creativity. So many of these are sort of outside-the-box items. And there's just so many. There's a 100 of them. And that's if, you know, you can pay the $2 and get 100 items. So really, really cool. I mean, that's like a dollar for 50 items. Um, Really good price. I love the artwork, everything about this that I've seen. So look for it in the links below under Arcane Tools, Treasures, and Trinkets and give it a click. Next, we have Explorer's Guide, a collection of places. It says, uncover a world of adventure with unique locations, thrilling encounters, and treasures beyond imagination it's from yellow bite studios 21 dollars 84 for 419 pages and it says within the pages of this book you'll find a collection of immersive and detailed descriptions of various locations each ripe for exploration and adventure whether you seek to journey through the wilds delve into ancient ruins or explore strange new worlds this guide has something for you each chapter is carefully curated to provide you with a unique experience from the horrors of the undead to the wonders of the celestial realm We've even included some futuristic locations for those who seek a bit of science fiction. Uh, so you get 200 unique and exciting locations, immersive descriptions, uh, a huge variety of places from wilderness, urban, aquatic, planner, horror, ancient ruins, science fiction, steampunk, celestial, demonic, uh, and then encounter ideas for each of those and treasure ideas. So. You would want to use this to supplement your own homebrew. Maybe you have a campaign that you're trying to flesh out. Maybe you're doing a hex crawl and you want to figure out what's in a certain hex. Whatever it is, you you would sort of partner with this book to, to create whatever's going to be there. Because it's not going to give you everything. It's not going to give you all the stats of the magic item or, or the creatures there. You're going to have to look those up and come up with those things. But it's going to give you sort of everything that goes around those things. So it gives you all those sort of details of the location and a lot of inspiration. So if you look at the table of contents, I mean, there's a ton of stuff. Wilderness, there's like 20 options. Urban, another 20. So you could even roll a D20 and say, okay, for this next hex, it's gonna be urban. I've already decided maybe I've rolled a D10 to determine what kind of setting it's gonna be. So it's gonna be urban. And then I'm gonna roll a D20, and I'm gonna just, I'm gonna I roll a an 18. So there's a museum there, and then I'm gonna to go to page 86. And I'm gonna use what's there to flesh out this hex, right? So so many, so many ways to use this. You never know when you're just like, ah, okay, I've created seven regions, and I need nine. I'm just not feeling it. What else can I do? And then you can use a book like this to just kind of even if you don't use it as is, you can use it for inspiration you can use it to trigger your mind to get you to finish 
all nine locations or whatever it is you're trying to do, right? So it talks about how to use it, browse the introduction, explore the locations, using counter and treasure ideas, etc. But overall, have fun. It goes through, it describes what each of the 10 uh, different types of areas are. Um, and then it goes right into the wilderness. So we're going to get to see uh, one of those here in a second. So I'm going to uh, actually two. So the first one is called the Luminous Glade. It says a clearing in the middle of the forest where the trees are illuminated by glowing mushrooms. At night, the glade is a beacon of light in the darkness. And so they have artwork for that. And then you get a bigger, bigger description. And this can be read aloud because it says, as you venture deeper into the dense forest, you feel the ground beneath your feet become spongy and soft. The rustling of leaves and twigs crunching underfoot echoes all around you. But as you step into the clearing, the sounds of the forest fall silent. So very moody. Very nice that it's written in that that second person so you can make it feel like they're really, um, really there. Then after you get through that, it looks like five paragraphs of, of description that you can read aloud. You've got all these possible encounters. So there's quite a few there and then possible treasures. Um, so you can you can look through these, pick one and flesh it out. Like I said, pulling in the stat blocks, the maps, whatever you want to use, or you can just wing it, you know, depending on how you feel about running things um, or just have it be backstory of where something happened, but you're not actually going to have an encounter there. So, so many options. Uh, but the first one is this Fae Revelry. As you approach the glade, you hear the faint sound of music and laughter. Upon entering, you find a group of Fae creatures dancing and frolicking amongst the glowing mushrooms. They invite you to join in the revelry. But beware, their fun and games may have unexpected consequences. So it's like a teaser, right? And you can even read this aloud to your players. And then you, as a DM, need to decide, okay... What are the creatures? Um, what what happens if you participate? What happens if you don't? So it's a starting point. Then over on the other side, they've got the possible treasure. So it says Fey Lantern, a lantern made of iridescent mushrooms enchanted by the Fey to provide a soft and warm glow that illuminates even the darkest corners. It can be carried or hung, and its light has a calming effect on those nearby. So it doesn't give you like all the typical stats for an item but enough that you can make make it whatever you want you can add your own price point your own stats if there's you know any kind of roles that need to happen etc but they seem sort of general enough that they won't need it like this one just has a calming effect so that could be anything maybe they have advantage on something or or they lose a condition if they you know if they're frightened maybe they lose that frightened condition or they have advantage to lose it whatever um, so you're going to have to figure out some things. It's not, it's not all done for you, but that's okay. Cause they're giving you tons and tons. I mean, 419 pages of this type of prompting and inspiration. So the next one, the weeping willows, a swampy area where willows grow with vines that seem to reach out and grasp at those who pass by. The trees are rumored to be inhabited by ghosts. So, and again, you have an image that you can share. Um, and then you get paragraphs to read, possible encounters, possible treasures. It says ghostly apparitions. As you move deeper into the swamp, you catch sight of ghostly figures floating among the willow trees. They seem to be watching you with hollow eyes, their misty forms almost transparent. You can hear their mournful whispers in the air. But when you try to approach them, they disappear into thin air. So, Again, as a DM, with that encounter option, you'd have to figure out, is this a ghost stat block? What kind of, do I even need a stat block? Is it even going to be possible to have combat with this thing, right? So decisions will have to be made. But the point is, you're not starting from a blank page. You're not starting from nothing. This book is giving you 419 pages of this type of inspiration with many, many different types. We just looked at wilderness, but again, it goes through urban, aquatic, planner, ancient ruins, science fiction, steampunk, celestial, demonic, etc. So the different planes, you know, we do have planescape coming up. Could use this for some of those planes, uh, especially the celestial and demonic ones and the planner ones. Um, so I really think uh, this is going to be a good tool to have on hand for inspiration and to, like I said, flesh out things. You could do a hex crawl just with this book. I mean, especially with the, the convenient numbering. I mean, you roll 1 through 10 to determine what type of hex, then you roll 1 through 20 to figure out which of the, the places. 
And some of them, I don't know how many possible encounters or possible treasures, but those might be numbered in a way where you could also roll. Um, uh, you know, I'm not sure if there's an even amount in all of those, but there's always a way to make it work. You can wait some or whatever with a D100. So anyway, I hope you check it out. It's in the links below under Explorer's Guide. Give it a click. Next, we have The Founding of Bridgemire, a role-playing adventure written, illustrated, and designed by Brian Jansen. And it's $4.99, system neutral, 40 pages. And it says it's a lighthearted sandbox adventure telling the tale of how the greatest city in the realm found its roots in a stinking swamp surrounded by wilderness. So it's a three-part sandbox style adventure. Random tables for complications, NPCs, plots, and loot to spice things up. And it's fully illustrated. And, uh, you know, looking through this, there is some real talent on display because you've got really great writing and really great art and i really appreciate that because you know being able to do both of those things one person being able to do both of those things is is really cool and then designing and on top of all that right uh, it's one thing to write but then to design uh is is good as well but this is a really interesting you know sandboxes on their own are interesting but i think this particular one i like because it's not only a sandbox but it's also unveiling the history of a region and so we're gonna we're gonna read some of this and and i think the 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 writing is kind of fun fun tongue-in-cheek stuff too so it says the city of bridgemire the great stinking center of civilization not so long ago was just a tiny village and a rickety bridge over a swamp but nothing great was ever accomplished without a tremendous amount of discomfort with muddy boots aching backs and big dreams these humble beginnings would set the stage for the greatest city in the post l era so let's take a look back and see exactly how that improbable that improbably series of events all played out so you're, you you have a number of past events that you're going to be able to play through which is really cool um, it says, this adventure is first and foremost a sandbox. However, this book assumes the group will follow a few major threads, arrival and exploration of the wilderness, forge a road, and build a bridge somehow, then take part in settling a new community. So if you if you run this and then you fast forward later for your next campaign and have it be in this city, anybody who was at the table for this adventure can feel like they helped create this thing. They might even be mentioned by by tavern keepers or shopkeepers uh in that city as as things um you know depending on the impact of what they do um so it goes through part one the mire second is the bridge and then the founding of this of this of this location and then it gives you a bit of context you know the post l era and um the current day all of that stuff here but i mean look at these beautiful illustrations so cute and uh, I mean, I just really like this. You've got the Meyer Step, the Drew Dodd Plateau, the Meyer itself, Yourswood, because this is where a town is going to be built. And it looks sort of unforgiving right now with how much water is there and, and marshiness, right? This Meyer. It says the Meyer, a solid thorn in the side of many travelers of the rest, Western Road, so much so that after 190 years of failed attempts to establish a route through the endless stinking muck, the road was finally moved north of the Drew Dodd Mountains, adding 16 days to the trip if the weather holds. But where so many others have fallen short, you will succeed, probably. Fortune or death awaits. And so then it leads right into the Allswood. And it talks about Glint, a sentient magical shield, a masterful craftsmanship, protects the southern woods from the ant blight and anything else that intrudes. Glint can fly, move about quite swiftly and is quick to block or push away anything or anyone it deems an intruder or beat them bloody if need be um, and then it gives you some more background on glint uh, and then you have eliza a brilliant but half man young woman uh, maintains a modest camp she has cobbled together old glassware copperware and other bits of junk to create a series of silks producing tonics of questionable quality and effect she built churns though his ovens to get his enterprise off the ground but has not yet been paid back so you see all these little characters that are already there inhabiting this inhospitable area that you're going to have to potentially encounter because it is sandbox right so they're just going to lay out different places and then you decide how how the characters are going to interact with those um 
And then you've got the yours wood. It said thick with bramble and roots. The rough twisted trunks grow plentiful in the yours wood. Many have walked this path before in search of the road north, but now all is quiet. The quiet is stifling. In fact, some stillness rests uneasy over the forest. So cute artwork. You can see all the details here, lovingly written, lovingly crafted by a singular creator who's doing everything. I always love that. You, you know, it doesn't get lost in translation when you're doing literally everything, right? Um, so my guess is that the vision on the page is very close to Brian's, what's in Brian's head. And that's always exciting to me as a player, reader, um, and even just observer of what's out there. So I hope you check it out, get to know Brian's work. It's under Founding a Bridgemire in the links below. Give it a click. Next, we have Frosts of Izanzar uh, from Arcane Minis, and it's $14.99 on sale, normally $20, and it's for D&D. &D. And uh, I'm not sure what edition. It doesn't say over here on the right, but I'm guessing fifth. I think it's on the cover. Yep, fifth edition compatible, uh, 27 pages. And it says, this all-in-one adventure was released as one of their monthly releases. But um, this one happens to be for an average party level of 10 to 11. And again, we don't see a ton of adventures up that high in the level, so it's always nice to find one. It says, a tribe of Uxolians deep within the swamp has called for aid, seeking any brave enough to defeat the fabled creatures that dwell within their lands. Take on a horrific, grim brood spawner, able to birth disgusting young from its back, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Quag Claw, capable of slicing adventurers in half with a single blow, and delve into deep waters with the fabled Death Snapper, a creature so large and menacing it can disguise itself as a small island. In this adventure, the characters tangle with boss-level monsters in a quest to rid the Dreadmire Swamp of its horrid inhabitants. Grab your zap gun, your staff, your sword, and ready yourself for the terrifying legends of Dreadmire. So this Dreadmire Swamp sounds pretty dangerous, but you get, of course, the PDF. Then you get digital maps. You can see uh, snippets of them here. You get a soundtrack and you get a Foundry VTT pack all together for the price of the, the $14.99. So this is really designed as a complete package. So whether you just want to run the adventure without any aids, you can, or you can use some of the aids that they provide, like the soundtrack or the Foundry VTT or the the um, maps that they've got. Um, so very, very useful. And I like the focus on big creatures because people always want to know what's the, what's the big bad, right? So you can see inside here a healthy amount of flavor text to be read. I always like to see that. Um, and just gorgeous artwork. I mean, look at this sort of, it looks like um, in uh, some sort of assault. These creatures are breaking through a barrier maybe. Um, and these would be the adventurers getting ready to, to face off against them. Um, so it could be really, really cool. Um, but it says a recent emergence of Drekon, of a Drekon tyrant, a powerful creature whose very presence brings harsh blizzards, is causing the frozen wilds of Izanzar to become even deadlier. Under the tyrant's harsh rule, a Drekon tribe has been preparing for war, attacking multiple Titaran villages and hunting a large portion of the area's natural wildlife to near extinction in order to satiate the tyrant's gluttony. Their most recent attack in search of jewels and gold to present as an offering to the tyrant destroyed a Titaran village during its ancestral fire festival. Currently, it is unknown what the Drekon tribe's next target is, but with a seer at the tyrant's side, the scattered tribal villages of Izanzar are all at risk. So that's probably what we were seeing in that image, is a village sort of being assaulted. Um, and it talks about ways to get the characters involved. And it says, aboard the Axlar, as the night begins to draw to a close, the chilling winds of the frozen landscape assault you. Your time aboard the Sky Tamer's Axlar cruiser has been short, but to call it sweet, would be an exaggeration. However, the crew has done their best to accommodate you as they enter Izanzar for their own purposes. Your attention is quickly shifted as a sweet smell fills the air, drawing you in. So then they have to make wisdom saves or be charmed 
by a Naklura that is hunting the area for its next meal. So there's a lot of interesting one-of-a-kind creatures that are going to be in here. You can see some of the maps um, already, you know, this really kind of cool bridge. And it gives you various options, you know, if they do this, this happens. If they do that, this happens. Um, and here's another giant monster they're going to have to deal with. So if you have a desire to play against some unique monsters, big monsters or maybe have players are saying i want to go against something big like a kaiju you know like a godzilla type creature um this is going to be a really good option for you and i really really love that they're giving you a soundtrack and they're giving you the vtt stuff so you can have that full experience if you want you can even go without that and still have a fun adventure because they're giving you the full pdf which is 27 pages so quite a bit of stuff under Frost of Izanzar in the links below. Give it a click. Next, we have Guide to the Village of Barovia, which has already sold 101 copies in its first week. It's from the Dungeon Madams and is $3.54 for 34 pages. And it says, we fleshed out Barovia so you won't have to. Unlock the secrets of the iconic village of Barovia. Uh, the supplemental guide features a highly detailed color map and detailed descriptions of each of the houses that can be explored in the village, making it the perfect tool for dungeon masters and players alike. It also includes a number of interesting story hooks for low-level side quests, allowing your characters to explore the village from level 1 to 3 before they leave in terror and <laughs> explore the rest of Barovia. Um, so you've got unique storylines, new NPCs, uh, detailed descriptions, and it says, uh, no more death house. Our guide can be used as a replacement for the death house quest, giving you even more value for your money. Don't miss out on the opportunity to enhance your Curse of Strahd adventure. So yeah, you can lead this right into Curse of Strahd or not. You can just create your own Ravenloft stuff. And it says, all proceeds from selling this PDF will go directly towards an ex-coworker of my husband who continues to fight the fight in Ukraine. She uses this money to buy up old Jeeps, drones, food, and other supplies and drives these to the front line herself. So going uh, money going to a good cause, it says. And um, I just, I think this is a really cool thing to have because, you know, it, not everybody wants to just follow the written adventure. Some people want to go off on their own. Some DMs want to maybe start with the written adventure, but then let the characters truly go wherever. If they don't want to stay on the path of the story, they'll just let them go, right? So having this fully... I mean, every, it looks like every building is numbered almost here. I mean, there's some open spots, of course, for for your characters as well, but but it is fully numbered in the map here which is really really cool so yeah jumping into the text you can see they've got a healthy selection of uh, flavor text for you and some really fun artwork every single one of these locations because they're divided sort of into sections right so this is section b2 and then there's numbered areas and there's a full color map of the town elsewhere as well i'm not sure if it's in in here or not but you can see the whole book in the preview, so you can really see where all the different areas are, what's going on in there. And here's a starlight opal that looks really fun. Uh, something is boarded up and zombie infested, it looks like. Um, some of them have different rooms that are labeled, uh, so you can learn more about those. But and, and I mean, this artwork is really fun too. Like, you can show this to your players, and it sounds like they give you the images. Um, separately as well so that you can you can use them to show to your players as you go through the different places so it says home of the meat pie addicts this house is home to a family of a man and his three children his wife perished last year in the peasant army and he's been addicted to meat pies ever since he sold two of his youngest children already the remaining three are soulless so morgantha would not take them if the characters are able to glimpse inside read the following uh, the small home is furnished with a table and a few mismatched wooden chairs and features a sparse kitchen and a pathetic fireplace with a dirty floor adding to the overall atmosphere of neglect. So, you've got the flavor text to read, which doesn't reveal anything prior to the flavor text, right? So then you can choose how to expose this sort of family where there's the soulless children and uh, meat pie addicted father. Um... 
So yeah, I mean, it's fun. I mean, it's nice having all these options. What's behind door number 92? I mean, there's so many places to go, right? Um, so there's abandoned surf location. A stonemason's daughter says, this house is home to the stonemason's daughter, Katarina Petrova, and her four children. Her father and husband perished last year in the peasant army. If the characters are able to go inside, read the following. Uh, this home is adorned with polished stone accents and sturdy wooden furniture crafted by skilled hands. The sweet scent of fresh bread lingers in the air as the fireplace crackles with warmth and colorful hand-sewn quilts adorn the walls. So you see fun stuff awaiting you. And th these are just some of the basic places we've been. I mean, as I said, as you go further deeper in here, you get the Blood of the Vine Tavern. You get um, Boarded Up Butcher's Home. Lots of zombie places, a goat herder family, uh, metal worker, old man carpenter, rat infested locations. It says Mad Mary's townhouse, fisherman's home, home of the old coward. So tons of stuff and the Starlight Opal is um, in the boarded up baker's home. So you're going to find all kinds of stuff and it all begins with this map that they have that, that shows you the town and has everything numbered. So you know literally whatever street they go down, anywhere, that what's there, what's there? You can say, oh, it looks like a dilapidated house, you know, and, um, and then they get inside and it's rat infested or whatever, right? So fun, fun, great content that you can use for Ravenloft, Curse of Strahd, or even beyond. I mean, you can take some of these descriptions and put them in another town. So it's nice to have this on hand and it sounds like it's going to go to a good cause, all the purchase uh, monies. So cool, cool. Look for it in the video description links under Guide to the Village of Barovia and give it a click. Next we have Hellboy uh, and this is the latest in the Corhonan series. Part two, The Wet Werewolf. So, you know, Hellboy role-playing game came out, um, I don't know how long ago, but we covered it on this show. And it's it's basically a role-playing game for Hellboy, but it's using fifth edition rules. So you can basically play Hellboy with what you already know how to do in Dungeons and & Dragons. And so this is one of the adventures that they've released for it. Um, and you don't have to have played the previous one. You can you can start with this one as long as you know your characters are, are of the appropriate level. Um, but it says, 16 hours ago, the Bavarian town of Gunsenhausen has had a strange phenomenon, a rain of fish, and not just river fish, all manner of fish, both fresh and salt water. Three people were injured, a woman in a car crash, a man fell off his bicycle, and another man got stabbed by a swordfish. A local reported it as suspicious to the state police who took one look at it and called the federal office for the protection of the constitution. They apparently have investigative jurisdiction as witchcraft is considered espionage and is against the Grund, Grund's sets, which is the German constitution. Luckily, a friend in Cologne, uh, the headquarters of the FOPC, was able to get this channeled our way before the locals started a brand new round of witch hunts. Get in there, figure out what caused it, see if it needs stopped. Whatever you do, don't let the tabloids get involved. Initial research will have to be done on the fly. The town's 50 kilometers from Nuremberg Airport, and your flight leaves in an hour. When you arrive, it'll be after dark. A hotel will be ready if you don't want to visit the hospital straight away. So, you know, this is in the world of Hellboy, where there is paranormal stuff going on. Monsters are real. Witchcraft is real. Um, you know, and it's kind of like you're an investigator, you know, in, in the vein of like X-Files or Mission Impossible, you know, being sent on missions, right, to do different things with a supernatural twist, right? Um, so, and then you get all the fabulous artwork of Mike Mignola and, and you know, the creator of um, Hellboy. So, and, and down here are links to the full books, you know, to get you started players and, 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 and basically uh, DM books. But inside you can see they've got really cool artwork from past issues of the comic. It just really gives you that whole vibe of Hellboy, which is awesome. So then, then it says, that, you know, the people of Gunsenhausen authorities included are generally open and welcoming, situated on the banks of the river Altmuhl. This is a historic town with classic architecture and street design. Sites of note include a market plaza, a Catholic church of Gothic construction, and a modern evangelical church. A triplet of museums, two towers from the town's 14th century defenses, and the nearby Altmuhl. 
Mulsey Lake. Uh, steeped in history as it is, there are plenty of superstitions and local mysteries to provide red herrings and alternative threads. And then it gives you technology research table, history research table using you know DCs, of course, because again, this is fifth edition rules, right? Applied to Hellboy world. Um, you've got occult research table, what you would find out, bureaucracy research table, and then um, talks about how to handle bad roles. But let's just reveal a couple things for these charts so you can get a feel for how cool this is. So. We'll start with technology. So if you if you roll high, it says the car's brakes were fouled with fish guts. Okay, so that explains that. Um, history research table. The town was surveyed by BRPD uh, psychic two years ago. Nothing significant. The report has more on places to eat than ghosts. So that's, that's an interesting detail. Um, and then occult research. There are demons with this sort of power, but this feels like a prank. So that could be your one of your first clues there. Um, and then for bureaucracy, it says the police will help the agents track down the addresses of the injured parties and will volunteer evidence. The swordfish is a taxidermic recreation of a trophy catch and a private collector has claimed it was stolen from his residence. Hmm. So me, I'm thinking, hmm, maybe these fish didn't come from the water. Maybe they were stored somewhere and potentially in water there as well but i mean not just from the wild <laughs> ocean or or wherever right uh, so yeah you get little clues you're investigating in this in this world of you know you're a member of the brpd and and um you're gonna have this this cool experience as if you were in a hellboy comic book and i love it i think that's cool i love when people take fifth edition and expand it to uh, familiar settings that we know and love so check it out it's under hellboy Corhonan series part two in the links below give it a click next we have monster souls uh from compass publishing health house author erf jordan and it is a really cool book i got it through the kickstarter um because it was a kickstarter and now it's available for everybody and it says monster souls is a guide to capturing souls in battle crafting them into one of 170 plus new magic items and awakening hidden powers within them so really really fun it's 1995 for 152 pages it says there are a few things more satisfying in a role-playing game than facing down with a powerful foe barely escaping with your life and being rewarded for your titanic efforts with a unique and iconic magic item earning a magic item from a fallen foe is an exciting event that feels like another line in the epic legend of your character this moment is even more memorable when the item brings the foe's deadly powers under your control after all who hasn't wanted to grab a demon's magical sword or harness a dragon's mighty breath weapon but not every monster has an obvious magic item to loot you might be able to grab a lich's staff or a giant's belt but what do you take from a sentient tornado or a gigantic tunnel boring worm monster souls aims to close that gap with soul items a special type of magic item crafted from the captured soul of a dying foe so you get rules for capturing souls crafting them into items and awakening their true powers Plus, you get 170 plus already done. Um, and it says dormant and awakened forms for each item, allowing players to discover new powers as the game proceeds. And then tons of, of illustrations to go along with that. And, and I love that it, it gives you kind of an understanding of how these are, are put together. So that if you want to make your own, because you're surely going to have, you know, access to infinite, nearly infinite types of creatures for your game so this book can't possibly cover every creature right so it gives you some ideas on how these are you know the rules for capturing souls etc so if you want to do your own thing you can um but it goes through like what is a soul item how to create them and awakening them and then it goes through the different soul items the 170 plus through the creature types then there's a shop that deals with this stuff that, that is detailed as well and then this faction called the soul hunters and their sort of their headquarters are detailed um and then there's a class called the spiritualist with um its own um, subclasses of course and then some item tables etc so really fun stuff and you know erf jordan always does such great clean writing very i, I don't think i've seen a typo in erf's work before and um, it's so nice to be able to just relax and read 
um, work from 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 this creator without having to like oh you know okay I gotta fix that typo or that 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 mangled sentence in my head as I'm reading right <laughs> so it's it's comforting knowing that you're in for a good read and you don't have to to stress about it and um, yeah you can see it goes through the rules so you can read about the rules here um, and then it gets into some of the the um, minor properties. That, that it might have and then the major property is beneficial and detrimental um, so again you can create your own stuff right but here's the abolet this is an abolet soul can be crafted into a deep lash if used for a non-soul item it instead creates a rod of rulership uh, and so the deep lash is a soul weapon it's a whip it, it's rare and requires attunement the strange whip resembles a slimy tendril with a coil of scaly leather around its hilt it squirms uncomfortably in your grip but it's dormant and when it's dormant it's, it has the following properties it's a magic weapon you gain a plus one bonus to attack and damage rolls um it has five charges and regains 1d4 plus one expended charges daily at dawn and it has an acidic slash trait as says when you hit a creature with a melee weapon attack using the whip you can expend a charge to coat the target in acidic mucus this attack deals an extra 48 acid damage and the target can't regain hit points until the end of its next turn when the effect wears off the mucus vanishes so cool useful effect but then it has an awakened property in its awakened state the whip has the following extra property so it increases those numbers um, for all those sections um, but then it also has psychic dominance as an action you can expend three charges to cast the dominate person spell on a creature within the reach of the whip so yeah it's cool how it can it can grow and i'm sure it talks earlier in the book about you know how to awaken an item and and what what triggers that but you can see a gibbering mask which would be from a, presumably a gibbering mouther yep um so many things and then again you know each one has minor beneficial detrimental and major beneficial and detrimental properties so that you can again um kind of create some of your own and and apply those um as needed to to whatever you're looking at but you can see 50 of the 152 pages so quite a few of the items as you go through i mean we even have a unicorn here with a blessed horn spear but the beginning goes through kind of how to create these items you know soul crafting um it says capturing souls there are many methods of capturing souls and creating soul gems two of which are described in this section no matter the method used one rule is true the more powerful a soul is the more valuable the gemstone must be in order to contain it when capturing a soul in a gemstone refer to the soul gem quality table to determine whether the gemstone used is valuable enough to contain the soul so you know gems have varying even in the real world varying levels of of um, cost and so you know you're not going to just use the cheapest gem to capture the soul of the strongest monster right so so you have to figure it out um and uh yeah start capturing these these creature souls uh, using it looks like there's a spell here a third level necromancy spell that you use and then there's also a magic item that can do it so even if you're not a spellcaster you have a way to capture these souls and it talks about the prerequisites um, crafting time all that identifying soul gems um, and then complications that can happen as as part of soul crafting if you want to explore those and then awakening them um, and it says when a soul is separated from its body and stored in a gemstone it falls into a sleeping state akin to in a coma uh, using the soul gem to create a soul item partially awakens the power of the soul empowering the item with magical properties but the item's true potential isn't unleashed until the soul is wakened from its slumber um so you got dormant etc when a soul item is created it has an awakening score of zero the score can be increased in a number of ways each of which is described below uh when a soul item's awakening score reaches a certain limit determined by the item's rarity it awakens giving the wielder uh more access so um so if it's if it's a legendary you're gonna have to get that score to 250 if it's common you only have to get it to 10 and so it goes into you know talking about different like awakening quests that you can do um and it gives even a d8 table with those uh, to help flesh out these items and awaken what's what's there and then it even has a section on returning to dormancy 
um, and dealing with sentient items if you want. So, um, so much detail. And I love that you can read all of this before you even uh, purchase the book. But uh, like I said, I backed it on Kickstarter. I think it's really fun. Uh, ERF Jordan and Compass Publishing House always put out really cool, good stuff. So um, I wanted to add it to my collection. And I'm glad I did. I hope you do too by looking for it in the video description links. It's under Monster Souls. Give it a click. Next we have MPC Centissimo or Centesimo. I'm not sure how best to pronounce that. But it's by John Paget. It's $14.95, 60 pages. And it is really just 100 pre-generated NPCs ready for you to use. But I know we've covered NPC books before. There's something different about this one. And that is that they have stats for various levels. So it's not like you're just getting, oh, here's your CR zero NPC and then you're done. No, you're getting stats for various stages of growth within that character. So if you want the character to sort of grow with your party, if you want them to be encountered at different tiers in the game, you can because it's not like it's stuck at CR zero and then, you know, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, right? Um, so they include all 12 ca classes and span 25 creature types. Each NPC has a brief backstory that includes their background, personality, and aptitude, um, their bonds, motivations, and a plot hook. They also have one or more unique abilities, a unique creature trait, a weakness, uh, which will affect their behavior and roles in some way, a selection of existing creature attributes and class abilities, and then, like I said, you get a low level, which is around level 5, a mid-level, level 10, and a high level, level 15. Um, and there's also 8 animal companion stat blocks. So, good amount of things in here for you. Um, and you can see how they, they, they break it down and, and show you how they're going to reveal each thing. It's got alphabetically... Um, and then it's by creature types. So if you want a certain creature type, you know, and it goes through, I think, 25 or so. So you've got Triton, Half Orc, Vidalcan, Warforge. So wherever you're adventuring, you know, if there's Kinkus there or Giths or, or you know, whatever, um, they're going to be there. If you need a Rogue, you need a Monk, a Bard, they've got tables for you here. And then, of course, uh, just a complete list by page as well. So right off the bat, we have Alora who is a lost elf cleric with possessions listed, background, all the, the typical stat block stuff, including the abilities, and then the low-level stats, mid-level stats, and high-level stats. And even within the abilities, there are slashes used to say, okay, this is low-level, mid-level, high-level. So three different levels for each of these. Again, we've seen NPC books, but to have one with you know stats that vary is really cool. So it says Alora is from the Lost Group, a fiercely independent and secluded elven community. She is brave and reflective and was a gladiator for a time before becoming a cleric, wishing to protect others. She carries a prayer book of Timora, the goddess of good fortune, which belonged to her father, and she wishes to prove herself as a worthy follower of the goddess. Very recently, a blessed buckle has been stolen from one of the temples. It has the power to grant immense luck, has already used it to cause chaos and destruction in nearby towns. She is seeking help of adventurers to track down a goblin called Snitchgrot and retrieve the coin before the goblin's luck causes irreversible damage. So she has her own agenda, right? And so that's detailed. Then, of course, with all the traditional stats, and um, it says reading aspects the npc can take an action to concentrate and moving no more than 10 feet that turn they can discover one aspect of a creature so you know the dm can choose what that is and if this is an ally you know that could be discovering a resistance for you but it's nice that the possessions are listed so she has a long sword a rope a pocket knife an old prayer book of timora uh in her possession so Cool, and you can just go through looking at all these different NPCs that you have fleshed out for you with images and, um, you know, just story potential, right? Um, and, uh, you know, some of them are really cool looking. And uh, you just never, you can never have enough NPCs. You can never have enough. And I'm really thankful to see a book that is going into those mid-level, high-level, low-level stat blocks. Uh, so that, that that you don't feel like, oh, I really want to use this one, but I got to convert it up, etc. right? So look for it under NPC Centesimo and give it a click. It's in the links below. Next, we got Phagefall, A Crisis 
in diesel space from the Illuminati or Illuminati. Uh, I'm not sure how, how best to pronounce that, but it's 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 like Illuminati, but spelled a little different. Six dollars and sixty six cents for the ninety three pages. And it says, a realm of high-octane adventure and danger lurking around every corner within this wild space system, the world of Diortet, and its sprawling megacity in Dustropolis are a hotbed of political intrigue and cutthroat corporate competition. Um, and it says, here, parties of daring adventurers fly through the skies on airships powered by roaring diesel engines to fend off raiders and pirates, militant workers, unions resist megacorp control by sp sabotaging uh, factories and organizing strikes and vehicles roll off the assembly line for shipment to every corner of the verse so moving from system to system infecting all life it can find the viral hive mind of the sea virus arrives as a megaphage a mile wide bioship quickly or quietly descending on a on a prey planet filled with mutant specimens of those poor souls infected on the last world the bestial alien intelligence feasted upon so you're going to have to deal with this really crazy virus. Um, you know, you can make this a Spelljammer world that you travel to through the Spelljammer mechanics, or you can just have your campaign be set on the world of, you know, in this this place called Dior Tet, which is part of the diesel space, uh, wild space. So let's look inside. Um, so it goes into adventures there, the planet, the partisans war, travel, um, and then a bunch of adventuring seeds and then phage fall, which is a sort of campaign focused on um, dealing with this this plague like virus that's going to to show up. Um, and here is a map of diesel space. So you get all the little planets where everything is, the moons. Um, Dior Ted is here. And it looks sort of like surrounded by some asteroids or something. Um, and then it goes through all the different bodies describing that. And uh, it says the asteroid belts, all the, all the locations are going to be detailed for you. And then you get to Industropolis and uh, more pictures of that. And the Partisans War. So we're just going to scroll through. But you get to see 60 of the 93 pages. You can see all the kind of like uh, tech in here, which is fun. Uh, because, again, you can, you can play this game from, you know, Paleolithic cave person time periods all the way to the far far future uh you know i realize a lot of the games are set in fantasy sort of medieval or middle ages-esque maybe renaissance era even um style settings but there is no limit you can and look at this crazy um sort of virus creature that's going to come out and that one that one is a cr 21 so you're going to have some some big nasties to deal with um and uh looks like you might have some help though so yeah scrolling through just looking at all the cool stuff in this book so much so much imagery if you if you're at all a fan of sci-fi or um in, industrial kind of settings i think you're gonna you're gonna really like this so let's just read a little bit about industropolis it says industropolis is a bustling metropolis of 18.5 billion people a technology technologically advanced society of mostly humans and gnomes on the planet dior tet uh, where hover cars and trains are a common mode of transportation while smaller towns uh, exist on the planet's surface outside this megacity. It is the only area of dense humanoid population on the planet. Despite the city's advanced technology, it is plagued by a failing infrastructure that threatens to undermine its progress and prosperity. First founded by the Exploitative Cyclopean Mining Corporation, a unionist revolution overthrew the preliminary planetary government and left the workers in charge. With the producers in control of the economy and the government trade uh, trade boomed. For a time, the owner class disappeared and laws were drafted for workers' protections, drawing many from other industrialized worlds to migrate here to leverage their particular set of skills for better working conditions. The city grew and grew until an invasion by their Martian neighbors threw the megacity into chaos some 450 years ago. And it was a six-year war against the Martian invaders. Um... So yeah, lots of history to explore, and this ties into some of the Illuminati's other books as well. 
So yeah, I think this could be really fun. It's just really hard to pick what to read because there's just so much goodness. I hope you come here and read through all of this because I'm just again scrolling through and showing you all the different hovercrafts and blimp-like built uh, things, zeppelins that are, that are floating around. And the, the, here's a sort of crazy-looking building that looks like it's made out of cargo uh, shipping containers. I mean, fun, fun stuff. If you're just listening and not watching, you'll want to want to look at this one for sure. Uh, it is called Phagefall, a crisis in diesel space, and it is in those links below. So be sure to give it a click and read through some of that stuff on your own because that is a low cost for 93 pages. All right, next we have Tome of Terrors, Compendium of Creatures, Volume 1 from Thor, B of 4. It's $6.99 for 118 pages. It says, prepare to embark on an epic journey and bring your 5th edition game to life with the Tome of Horrors, 118-page treasure trove overflowing with over 100 diverse and deadly creatures. From serene farmlands to dense forests, eerie dungeons to scorching deserts, and bustling cities to otherworldly planar realms, our comprehensive tome offers the perfect monster for any location, the Tome of Terrors expands and enhances the Monster Manual, providing Dungeon Masters with unparalleled options and flexibility to design pulse-pounding adventures with a vast array of creatures ranging from one half CR to the fearsome CR-50. Lucifer, your players will never know what awaits them around the next corner. So that's cool. And... I've never seen a CR-50. The highest the official ones go to is a CR-30. So I can only imagine what a CR-50 is going to be like. So that's interesting. Uh, and so it starts with uh, several angels. Looks like four different angel types. And then goes all the way down to Zephyrion, the clawed crab lord. So uh, quite a range of things. I mean, there's bramble fiends, mouselings, night crawlers, roach reavers, Quadro Chimera, Hatebringer Imps. I mean, tons of tons of interesting things. So yeah, we get to see 46 of the 118 pages. So I'm just gonna do a quick scroll through so you can see um, great stat blocks. They look really um, like the wizard ones. And you've got artwork for all the creatures. I mean, look at this fun creature here at the end. Um, and this one, this one here is called the Infinite Observer. It looks really interesting to me. It looks like an eyeball with um, tentacles coming out of it. It says, eons ago, when the universe was in its infancy, a cosmic event gave birth to an enigmatic being, the Infinite Observer. This entity was not born out of malice or benevolence, but rather as a byproduct of the energies unleashed during the universe's formation. From that moment on, the Infinite Observer has been silently watching, bearing witness to the countless civilization wars and wonders that have graced the cosmos. Rumors suggest that the Infinite Observer has influenced the course of history on occasion, subtly nudging events through the sharing of information. Some even believe that it has a grand design, accumulating knowledge to achieve a specific goal or purpose. However, no one has been able to discern its true intentions, and the Infinite Observer remains an enigma. Throughout the ages, various factions have sought to exploit the Infinite Observer's vast knowledge. Some have tried to forge alliances, while others have attempted to control or destroy it. Yet the Infinite Observer remains elusive, retreating into its pocket dimension when threatened and emerging only when it deems necessary. So there's a lot of history here for this. Um, but it is a CR-8 and it's got its ability to go into a pocket dimension, immutable memory. The infinite observer cannot be made to forget anything. Um, it has been observing the universe since the beginning of time. As such, it always succeeds on all history and knowledge checks. Um, it's got eldritch tentacles. It's got a seeker's bargain. It says the infinite observer can grant a creature within its telepathy range a single answer to a question, providing it with information or guidance. In exchange, the creature must willingly give the infinite observer a memory or piece of knowledge that the creature possesses, which is lost to the creature forever. GM determines the nature and quality of the information exchanged. So yeah, you can, you can, um, trade for information from this creature so this could be i could see a lot of uses for this you know we need to get the secret of something we need to find the weakness for this this big bad so you go to the infinite observer and you trade something you know to get that get that information that you desperately need so 
so fun and it, d d it dwells in a pocket dimension so again with planescape coming you can you can have it pop up anywhere um, as well as of course in wild space or or um, you know any setting forgotten realms kryn you know for dragonlance wherever um, but that's just one of so many creatures and in here there's going to be a cr50 for you as well um, I'm not sure what the total range is uh, or the breakdown of the different CRs, but I'm guessing with as many creatures as there are that there is a good amount. I mean, this first one is CR 13. We saw CR 8. Here's a CR 25. Um, so CR 24, uh, CR 20, CR 4. Yeah, so it's bouncing around. There's quite a bit. CR 9. So you're going to get a good mix. Another CR 4 there and another CR 29. So good mix of stuff. And that means you'll be able to use it for all levels of play, which is awesome. So look for it in the video description links under Tome of Terrors and give it. All right. Now we come to that part of our program where we give shout outs to titles that also released during this week that we didn't have time to really deep dive on. And the first is an equal portion dealt culture in character creation. It is $2.99 for nine pages, and it deals with another way to handle races which is really cool. Um, next, we have Arcane Armaments, which is armor, weapons, and items for 5th edition, and it is $5 for 40 pages. Then we've got The Bloody Wrath of Countess Macula, which is compatible with Dungeon Crawl Classics or 3.5 edition. It's an adventure level zero, so it's a funnel. It's $2.99 for the PDF, or you can get the soft cover black and white book for $9.99 or both for that price and it's 27 pages. We've also got Cavern Crawls number 12 which is called Frolicking Fay, and it's an adventure for level 1, $2.99 for 6 pages. Then we've got Circle of Nourishment, a druid circle, uh, $1.50 for 4 pages for that. Then we've got Escape the Mind Slavers, which is $9.99, and it's an Iron Kingdom's adventure. It's 53 pages. We've got The Illuminated Cavern, which is $2.99 for 15 pages, and it is an adventure for level 10, 5th edition. And then we've got Level Up Gate Pass Gazette, issue number 12, with a bunch of different uh, articles in it. It's $9.99 for the PDF, or you can get that soft cover for $14.99 or both for that same price, 24 pages. And it's for advanced fifth edition, A5E, level up, whatever you want to call it. But it's also, you know, that version of the game is backwards compatible with the official fifth edition as well. Then we've got Machinations of the Blank from Critical Crafting. It's $9.99 for 54 pages. And it's got encounters, items, and feats for 5th edition. Then we've got multi-classing feats, the Armorer edition. And it is only a dollar for six pages. And it's got feats that are for multi-classing. So you have to have a one class plus another class. It may even be specific subclasses required for those. Then we've got Spells from the Forgotten Vault, which is $20. It's for advanced 5th edition, A5E, level up, uh, and it's focused on a high number of spells. Uh, it's, it, as I said, it's $20 for 84 pages, so you're going to get tons of spells in this volume. Then we've got Strange Life Forms of the Astral Sea, Beings of the Distant Reaches, which is a bunch of monsters that fit well with Spelljammer, but they can go with other things. It's $1.99 for 13 pages. Then we have Subclassy Supplement number two, and it is, of course, a bunch of subclasses for $2. Uh, unsure of the page count, but um, a bunch of subclasses for you. Then we've got Tasha, Iglewilv, and Zibelina, or Zibilna, uh, from uh, Jonas Kuhlman, $2.99 for 19 pages, and it's already a best copper seller in its first week. And it's, it's really a bunch of reference items and prep for Wild Beyond the Witchlight. Then we've got Wilderness Dressing Jungles, uh, 375 for 10 pages. And I think jungles are always one of the hardest uh, things to sort of describe, uh, I guess, unless you live near one. 
Uh, I think it's much easier to describe for us a book like this with a bunch of descriptions and reference materials for for describing a jungle, I think will come in handy for DMs everywhere. But uh, that is only $3.75 for that, so very cool. Well, that'll do it for this week's episode. Please subscribe to the channel, like the video, leave us a comment, let us know what books you're going to pick up, or share anything you'd like to about Dungeons and & Dragons and uh, third-party books that are out there. Uh, be sure to share the video out there with friends so we can get more eyeballs on this and educating people that there's a lot of third-party material to consider. And uh, click those links. You know, help these creators uh, stay in business. Make sure to give them uh, your money so that they can keep on producing awesome, awesome books. And if you purchase anything after you click those links, you're going to help the channel as well because we get a small affiliate fee. So if you can bookmark one of those links and always use it to do your shopping, that would be great. Or just visit one of our videos right before you shop. That really, really helps a lot. Helps us keep going with this. And we really, really appreciate it. Um, if you want to help us even more, we've got seven books we've done, and they're all available in the links below, including our Mithril bestseller, uh, Feywild Companion, or you may have heard of our Dragonlance Companion, which is a platinum bestseller. And we've got a two-book Kickstarter coming later this year. It's a campaign setting plus an adventure. So we hope you follow us everywhere at Splinterverse so that you can find out about that, or you can join our mailing list at splinterverse.com or learn about our books there as well. But in any case, we appreciate the support. And my tip for uh, creators this week is to, once again, really, really think about your catalog page. If you think of me and others that are leading people to these catalog pages, we're like the sales people, like the initial sales people. But when you get to that catalog page, that catalog page needs to be the closer. It needs to close that deal. It needs to seal that deal. So if you don't put much time into your catalog page, you need to not be surprised if you don't sell that much. You really need to spend almost as much time on your catalog page as you do on the book. So make sure you're really thinking it through. What is a customer going to ask? Have your friends and family look at it. Have maybe a, a specialist, a marketer, or, or somebody take a look at it for you and help you craft it. If you work at it, you can really craft the text for it as you write your book. Maybe steal some stuff from the back cover, steal some stuff from the intro, or wherever, and really craft it together and think about appealing to both logic and emotion. Give us a list of things we're gonna get. Um, give us reasons why why we wouldn't want to miss it. Appeal to us emotionally, like oh gosh, you know, fear of missing out, right? Make us afraid to miss this title, but at the same time, show us logically all the things that we're gonna get for our money. And if you do that, you're gonna start drawing people in. You also need to add some visuals. A lot of these are just plain text, and it just it just doesn't work. You see a lot of titles that just never even get to copper seller, and that's a big part of the reason. They're not closing those sales. People are clicking, but they're going, mm, I don't know, I might want to save this money for something better, I'm not sure. You need them to look through that catalog page and go, this is a no-brainer, I gotta have it right now, I can't wait, I can't miss this, I might forget later, I, I just, it's, it's a no-brainer, I gotta put it in my cart and buy it now. Even if it just goes in the wish list, that's 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 good because maybe they'll come back when there's a sale, go through their wish list. You you gotta try to capture them in some way. So so that's my tip for you this week, and um, I wish you luck with that. It is very important, and I really do appreciate all of you watching, whether you're a creator, player, GM, or just somebody who likes to watch this. I know I watch a lot of channels that I don't even. You know, I watch crafting channels. I don't do much crafting, but for some reason it relaxes me. So if you're someone who's watching it just to fall asleep, I appreciate you as well. So thanks so much for watching, and until next time, happy adventuring. <laughs>